All right, we are almost halfway through Genesis. If you're a guest with us, that means we are, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll see that we began Genesis in January 2021. Um, so that means we got some time to go halfway through. We're in Genesis chapter 25. If you need a Bible, go ahead and raise your hand. One of our ushers will bring you one. If you don't own one, this is our gift to you. Uh, keep it, um, read it, know it. Love it. Uh, we are in Genesis chapter 25 today. And I, I want to start by saying this. We're going to, Abraham, the patriarch who we've been looking at uh, extensively for quite a while now, he's going to breathe, breathe his last breath and be buried with his wife. And I want you to know this. Abraham's life mattered. It matters. And we're going to talk about his legacy. But, uh, but I, want us to, that I want you to know this, that your life matters. Your life matters. Not just in your humanity and that, you, yes, you are made in the image of God, but what I'm talking about is your, the length of your life, the days of your life. Every day of your life matters. Abraham lived a legacy, and we're going to talk about his legacy and as we begin today. We're going to talk about what happened in his life and how God showed up in his life. And so I hope that that would be the same and be true for you. Abraham was not, when he first met God, a Christian. He wasn't a godly man. He was a pagan man. He was a man who worshipped false gods. His dad was a man who worshipped false gods, raised him up. He followed in his pattern, in his precedent of his father. And then God showed up and spoke to him and told Abraham that he would not only uh, live a different life than his father, but he too would become a father. Abraham's wife, Sarah, was barren. God, when he showed up, he spoke to Abraham and, and it spoke to the longing of his heart that he wanted to be a father. But he told him that he would, he, God would do it. He would give his barren wife a child. That child is Isaac. We've been looking at Isaac for, for quite a bit of time or for the past few weeks as well. And so today, we're going to see Abraham's last breath. We're going we're gonna to cap off his legacy. And then we're going to jump into the birth of Isaac's twin children. So Genesis chapter 5, starting in verse 21, or starting in verse 1. Abraham took another wife whose name was Ketrar. Abraham's wife, Sarah, has passed away. He's now remarried. That's what's going on here. And she bore to him. These are the children that she bore to him. Zimran. They have great names here. Some of you are going to have or having children. Some of you have children in the womb. Here's a great list of some names maybe. I don't know. Zimran. We'll start with that one. Jokshan. That's a, that guy will be tough. Uh, Medan. Uh, Midian. Uh, Ishbak. Uh, Shuha. Uh, Kod, and then Joke. J- this guy's a joke. Jokshan. Uh, Jokshan uh, fathered Sheba and Dinan. The sons of Dinan were. Ash uh, Irma and uh, let to him and, and Leum, this guy, that guy, that's some names. And then the sons of Midian were Epha, uh, Epher, and yeah, that's the guy. And then Hanok hey, and uh, Abda, 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 uh, and Elah. Uh, all these were the children of uh, Keturah. This is Abraham's second wife. Abraham, this is, the, this is the point. Abraham, after his wife has passed away, he continues to father other children. He gets remarried. He has a wife. But if you remember that prior to this, prior to Abraham, God even blessing Abraham with the promised son, Isaac, through his wife, Sarah, Abraham and Sarah disobeyed God. Abraham and Sarah disobeyed God. Uh, God had promised Abraham and Sarah that he would give them a child, give them Isaac, through Sarah's womb, but she was barren. So Sarah created this crazy plan and said, hey, why don't you sleep with this other woman? And Abraham said, you know what? Yes, honey, I'll do that. And like a fool, he has a child with another woman. And it's created a lot of drama in their life, and it still creates a lot of drama in the world that we're living in today. Look at the news. That's all because Abraham slept with the wrong woman. What's going on in the Middle East, the wars that are going on, started with Abraham sleeping with the wrong woman. From that, from Hagar's lineage became two nations, one Isaac's nation and one uh, uh, Jacob. Where we have Isaac and we continuing to Jacob, but we have Isaac and we have uh, Ishmael, the, the, the son of Hagar. Through this, the conflict in the Middle East is still going on because of this. These two nations born of Abraham fighting over the same piece of land. But what we've seen time and time again, that it wasn't about 
Abraham. It wasn't about Ishmael, and it wasn't necessarily about Isaac. It was about through whom the Isaac would give birth to, and through whom through him who they would give birth through, all the way through the line that would ultimately trace to the person Jesus. Jesus Christ would be is the true promised son of Abraham. And so right now what we need to understand is that, that Jesus is the Savior of the world. Not just then, but now and always. He's the one who the Jews need. He's the one who the Arabs and Muslim needs. He's the one who you need. You need Jesus. And so through that line, through that line of Hagar came a generation of people. But here, through this line of Ketar, or uh, uh, Ket. Keturah, uh, came another nations of people. Some of these Midian, some of these will oppose God's people later. I want you to see this. God promised Abraham that he would be a father of many nations. Many nations have indeed been born through Abraham. But while there's many nations, there's only one promised son, and that was Isaac. And so what does he do here? Abraham gave all he had to Isaac. He gave him everything. Isaac was the one true son. He was the promised son. But to the, to the sons of his concubines, what he's saying here is, is they're referring to Keturah Ketura, uh, as a concubine here, trying to distinguish now the difference between her, this wife, and Sarah. He, he's, he's making, the author's making distinctions here. And St. Hagar and, and Keturah, their sons, Abraham's going to give them some gifts. But to his inheritance and all that Abraham has, he's going to give to Isaac. So Abraham gives his other two wives or other two women uh, uh, in all those children gifts while, they're still, while he was still living and sent them away from his son Isaac eastward uh, to the east country. So Abraham's taken a wife after his, his wife has passed away. He's had many nations. God, I want you to see through this, through this whole story that God has indeed fulfilled his promise. God said to Abraham, you would be a father of many nations. He did not say they would all uh, like you. They did not say they would all uh, like Isaac. He says that I just promised that you would have many nations. And indeed, many nations are now birthed and born from Abraham. But I want you to see Abraham and Sarah are the center of the story uh, in this lineage, in this legacy that, that's being told here. And so that's why Isaac gets everything. The promised son gets everything. He gets the entire inheritance. He gets everything. Everything that was Abraham's, that he didn't give away in those gifts, he gives to his son Isaac. All that he has. And these are the days of, uh, verse 7, these are the days uh, and years of Abraham's life, 175. These are long years. These are hard years. These years of ups and downs. These are years that he had faith and he had great failures. Some of you are very aware of your fa the failures in your life. Some of you, you look at Abraham and you think, and you haven't been with us for, for a time as we've been studying Abraham, and you've only thought of Abraham the patriarch as this perfect man. This man who probably has uh, less sin than you, probably did uh, more good things than you. Let me just tell you about Abraham's legacy. It's riddled with sin. It's riddled with folly. It's riddled with even deception. After God tells Abraham he's going to be a father of many nations and that God has promised to bless him. And Abraham believed God and he was converted and he was saved. Abraham started worshiping God. The very next scene we see Abraham running to the hills, to Egypt, because there's a famine. He said, God, I know you said you're going to bless me, but I don't know that I trust you. So he runs into Egypt. What does he do? He tells the Egyptians that his wife, Sarah, the one in whom the promised child would come through, was his sister. So that the Egyptians took Sarah to be a wife for another man. This happens multiple times in Abraham's life. He gives his wife away. There are times in which he was faithful, but there was many times in which he was faithless. I want you to see that Abraham's story is not about his perfection. It's about God's redemption. Every, he, Abraham had gone, he's gone to war in these 175 years. He's watched a city be burned to, like, to, with tar and, and fire, Sodom and Gomorrah. He's, he's seen sexual perversion. He's seen, he's seen families destroyed. He's faced family drama. He's faced a lot of hardships. He's, he's endured well. He's had a lot, he's seen a lot of, Failure, though, in his life. But he's seen more mercy than anything. It's what you need to know. The Christian life is not the life of perfection. 
The Christian life is one that we are, we are put, focus, we're putting our eyes and our hope on the one who is perfection, who is perfect, Jesus. Abraham continues to put his faith in Jesus. Jesus continues to clean up and bless and, and fix what Abraham breaks. That's the story of the Bible. The story of redemption is we screw things up. We still do. Abraham did, even after he had faith. But I want you to see this, that there's more mercy and grace in the Lord Jesus than there is sin in you. You must understand that. Many of you think that, there, that, that, God, that you have so much sin that you could not share. Some of you think that you've, you've deceived and lied your way and, and manipulated your way and, and, and done things that you, you, you don't even want to speak of and you think that you, God cannot even forgive you. It's not true. Abraham is a picture for us of, of the redemption that God has in store for all humanity, anyone who would place their faith in him. So Abraham breathed his last in a good old age, an old man full of years, and was gathered to his people. In Genesis 15, 15, God actually promised this. What I need you to see this is that in this legacy of Abraham, God shows up and says something, and then later it happens. Sometimes it takes a long time. Some of you, God has shown up, and, he, and you feel like he's speaking to you, and you're like, hey, hey when is that going to happen? I want you to see this, that God promised, even in the beginning with Adam and Eve, that he promised that there would be a son, Jesus, that would come, the Savior, who would crush the serpent's head. And it took years, thousands of years for this to happen. God is never late. He's always on time. God's word is timeless, and it speaks to us even in our time. So here, what we see, I want you to see when it says here that Abraham breathes his last in a good old age. He's not just, it's not just a fact. This is something that literally in Genesis 15, 15, God said would happen. God said it and it happened. God said it and it happened. God said it and it happened. That means if God has said he forgave your sins, he's forgiven them. Stop holding on to them. Stop living your life according to them. Stop identifying yourself with the sin of your past. If God has said you're forgiven, you're forgiven. He who the Son sets free is free indeed. God said that Abraham would die at a good old age, a man full of years, and he did. Verse 9, Isaac and Ishmael, his sons, buried him in the cave of Machpelah in the field of Mephron, the son of Zehor, the Hittite, east of Mamre. This is the field that Abraham had purchased from the Hittites. We, we saw this a few weeks ago. Abraham purchased the field, and then he purchased a cave to bury his wife in. We actually got a picture of it. If, we'll throw it on the screen. Uh, this is, the, this is the, 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 what has now become the cave of Machpelah. What this is, is the, this is not only Abraham is buried here, but Isaac is buried here. Jacob is buried here. Sarah is buried here. This is where the patriarchs of Israel are buried. This was a monument built, and both Christians and Muslim, uh, Jews and Muslims go to this, this to pay homage and pilgrimage and honor the patriarch Abraham. And see, I want you to see this. While this is an awesome structure, this is a real historic place, a real historic time. Abraham was a real man, buried in a, bought a real cave, and was buried there with his real wife. But I want you to see this. Notice, not if any of you ever asked the question, where's the, uh, the cave of Jesus? I heard he was born in a cave, he was buried in a cave. You'd be right. Yeah, he too was, had a grave and was buried in it. But we don't know where the Lord Jesus was buried. Why? Because after he rose from the dead, no one cared. Everyone's going there to worship and, and, and pay homage and pilgrimage to a dead man, a dead patriarch. Jews and Muslims both go there. Christians, we don't go. We would go and understand history and it would be really cool to be there. We don't go to pay homage to a, a patriarch because the man Abraham, his life and legacy was not about him. It was about the coming one. Not Isaac, but the one after that. Not Jacob, not after that. But all the way, 2,000 years later, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. And so while this is a historic mo monument, this is a place of, uh, of awesome history, it should remind us that while Abraham is still in the tomb, the one we worship has no tomb. And there Abraham was buried with his wife. Verse 11, and after the death of Abraham, God blessed Isaac, his son. And God settled, or in, in Isaac settled in Bir la Haroi. 
You see this, Abraham passes away, breathes his last breath. Who shows up? God. He shows up. What does he do? He blesses him. What we're seeing here is that God is blessing Isaac just like God blessed Abraham. What he's saying, what is, what's being signified here is that the promise that continued, that, or that flowed from Abraham to his son Isaac was the same promise that God gave Abraham when he showed up in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. At the very beginning, God showed up and spoke to Abraham and gave him a promise. This same promise he's saying is now, God is saying, I'm bestowing this on you, Isaac. I'm bestowing this on you. And your son will also carry this promise. It's going to come into play here in a moment. We'll talk about his sons in a moment. But God has passed the torch over to Isaac. Isaac, like Abraham, is now under the blessing of God. We need to understand this. Those who've trusted Jesus, who are Christians, you too are under the same blessing. This blessing went from Abraham, it went to Isaac, it went to Jacob, it went all the way again to the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Anyone who comes to the, to the Father must come through Jesus Christ. The same blessing of promise is given to us. We are also descendants of Abraham, not by Jewish lineage or blood, but by faith. By faith. In this place, this interesting, this Bir, uh, Bir La Aroy, this place is, is the same place where God delivered Hagar. If you reflect back, God delivered her there. God answered her prayer. It's also the same place where Isaac, a few weeks ago, we we're looking at, he was in the field praying and longing for his wife. Isaac sets up, he lives in this land, this land that's known for God showing up, God answering prayers. He lives in this land. He longs for God's blessing. He needs God's help. He wants to walk in God's ways. And we're going to see that play out here in a moment when he prays for his wife. But verse 12, these are the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar, uh, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's servant, bore to Abraham. I already told you their story, but these are their kids. These are the names of the sons of Ishmael, named in the order of their birth. Nebioth, the firstborn of Ishmael, Kedar, Adbil, Mib, Sam, Mishma, Duma, Masa, Hadad, Tema, Jeter, uh, Mafish, and Kedma. These are the sons of Ishmael by their names, by the villages, by their encampments, the 12 princes according to their, their tribes. These are the years of Ishmael, 137 years. He breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. They settled from uh, Havilah to Shur, which is opposite of Egypt in the direction of Assyria. He settled there over against his kinsmen. Abraham's life has come to an end. His son Ishmael's life has come to an end. The next chapter, the next phase will, 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 will not only be Isaac, but it will be this, the sons of Isaac. Isaac's life is not detailed in, in, in a very large account through Genesis. But Isaac's life did have a massive impact. Isaac was the promised son of Abraham. Abraham was the prototype of faith. So that's what I want us to see as we, we cap off Abraham's lineage with the, his death and the death of, of his son Ishmael. I want you to see this, that over and over and over and over again through our study of Abraham's life, we've seen that God is faithful. God's faithful to, to complete what he started. God's faithful to start what he promised. God's faithful, God's faithful, God's faithful. Some of you need to be reminded of that. Some of you, it's been years and you feel like you haven't felt the faithfulness of God. You feel like God is not present. God is not near. Abraham, additionally, is not just, do we not only see that God's faithfulness through the life of Abraham, but Abraham for us is a prototype or a pattern or precedent of faith. We're told over and over and over again that Abraham believed God and it was counted to or credited to him as righteousness. What, he may, what it means by that is that he trusted God. He agreed with God. He didn't understand everything. He just said, all right, I, you're real. I trust you. I'm going to obey you. He doesn't do it perfectly, but he believes God. He puts his faith in God. He puts his hope in God. He puts his life in God. 
And that, that, that becomes a pattern and a precedent. That's why he's a patriarch. This is why, he, this is why we, we look to Abraham and he is the prototype of our faith. In the New Testament, it says, just like Abraham believed and it was counted to him as righteousness, so we too believe in Jesus and it's counted to us as righteousness. Meaning this, that God, Jesus Christ, takes your sin, your shame, your folly, your rebellion, your idolatry. He takes everything that you've done to not only ruin your relationship with him, but ruin your relationship with others. All the sin, all the shortcomings you have, and he takes it and he, and he, he trades you. He dies in your place for your sins, and he gives you his righteousness, his life. So when we believe that exchange is applied, it's already been done. It's already been done. Jesus has already died. He's already risen victorious. When we put our faith in him, that's now applied to your account. Believe. So several times we see that we've seen this, that Abraham, God has told him he'd be a father of many nations. He's now obviously through all the, through, through not only uh, Ishmael's lineage, but also the, 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 his second wife, Keturah, that we see that there's more nations that are, that are birthed from the seed of Abraham. But indeed here, he has become a father of many nations. He's become a father of many nations. But you must see this, while Abraham is a father of many nations, through one child, God has promised to bring, to bring about the Savior of the world. And so just like that, just like there are several nations that come from, from Abraham only, and only one promised son, the same thing for Isaac. He's about to have two children. There's only one. There's one son of the promise. Here we go. In verse 19, we're going to look at Esau and Jacob, the two sons, the, the twin sons of Isaac, Abraham's son. These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean and, uh, of Paddan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. When he was 40 when he got married, we talked about that last week, and Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife. Man, this is a good thing to do. We're going we're to get why he's praying here in a moment, but just generally speaking, men, pray for your wife. She, he, says, he says this, he prayed for his wife because she was barren. She, she couldn't have kids. He prays. He prays. I want you to see that what's happening here is the author is, is connecting us. Moses, when he's writing, is now connecting Isaac and Rebekah to Abraham and Sarah. Sarah, too, was barren. I want you to see this. God is showing us that the promise comes through miraculous birth. You know who, too, who also came through miraculous birth? Jesus Christ. That the way of the kingdom of heaven is, is miraculous. This is not normal. This is not a, 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 a normal pattern of normal human understanding. The, the, the kingdom of heaven is a supernatural kingdom. Jesus' mom, Mary, was a virgin. He was conceived of the Holy Spirit. The Lord Jesus came through a miraculous birth. Isaac came through a miraculous birth. A 90-year-old woman who was barren. That's a miracle. Here also, like Sarah, Rebecca is barren. So what do they do? He's like, I heard about this one. My mom couldn't have kids. And so what are we going to do? We're going to pray. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. You notice what they don't do. They don't follow in the pattern of Abraham and Sarah and go, you know what? You're not pregnant, honey. You can't get pregnant. Let me find a side chick. That's not what happens here. He learned from his father. I'm sure his father told him, hey, son, I was foolish. I rebelled against God. God, yes, forgive, gave me. But listen, son, if your wife is barren, don't take matters into your own hands. Take them to God. How many of you have taken matters into your own hands and you made a shipwreck of your life? You're, some of you are in a position where you need to just keep running to God in prayer. And so the Lord, what we see here is that we don't know how long he prayed, but he prayed. Until God answered, and the Lord granted his prayer. Hope that gives hope for some of you in your life. You're praying for something. You're longing for something. Don't stop praying. God is faithful. And what happens? Rebecca conceived. And the, tri the children struggled together within her. And, sh and she said, if, <laughs> if this is thus, why is it happening to me? You ever been there? Like, hey, God, 
What she's doing is praying now. She's praying. Hey, God, why is this happening to me? Ever been there in your life where you're just like, God, I'm questioning what's going on in my life. Why am I here? Why is this so hard? His children are struggling within her. And I'm, I've never had any children in my womb. Uh, I don't have a womb, by the way. Uh, spite. No, nah, we're not going to go down that trail. Uh, I do not have one, but my wife does. And she's, we've had, we've, my, my, my wife has given birth to four children. We had, uh, my wife was carrying twins, and we did miscarry twins. So we did not get, we, the struggle was different for us. For us, it was different. And we were at this moment in our, uh, in, in, when we lost these children, these babies, we were at this point where we were asked, like, why is this happening to me? One of the biggest longings of, of my wife and I is, uh, as, as parents is we longed to have twins. We did. We really wanted to. We really wanted to. Uh, my wife's father, uh, who's now passed away as well, I talked about a little bit last week, he was a twin. And we're just like, that would be super cool. That would be super cool. We always, we, we wanted to have twins. So it's happened. We're asking, why is this happening to me? I want you to know we never got the answer. We prayed and inquired. Now, God never said, hey, this is exactly why. Some of you are praying and longing for something. You're struggling with something. And you don't have the answer why. And so what we're going to see here is God does answer her. She inquires of the Lord. She's asking the Lord, why is this happening to me? And God is going to answer. But I want you to know, sometimes God doesn't answer. But sometimes he does. And so she went and inquired of the Lord, and and the Lord said to her. So she's asking, why is this happening? So the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples from within you, uh, and you shall be divided. One, uh, the one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. He's like, all right. God, what's going on? Thanks for the, the, two, the kids. I prayed for one. You gave me two. Seems like you're into multiplication. I like that. Uh, but why are they, like, fighting? What's going on? He, God says, hey, I'm going to answer you. I'm going to answer you, Rebecca. And this is why. There's two children. They're going to be two different nations. I'm going to actually do something awesome, and I'm going to take one child, and uh, through him is going to become the savior of the world, but it's not going to happen like you want it. There's going to be this, this, this forever struggle between these two, these, two, these two sons. You're even seeing it now in the womb, but see, you think the older is going to be the one who's going to be the leader and the one in whom the promise comes from. I'm actually flipping the script on you, and it's going to be the younger. The older is going to serve the younger. God answers her prayer. But then also in doing so, he foretells what is about to go down. Everything that we're about to see about Isaac uh, and and Rebekah and their their two sons, Esau and Jacob, uh, it's going to be actually, it comes from this, this this particular passage, this particular inquiry, this answer to this prayer. God foretold that this is how it's going to go down. And if God says it's going to happen this way, guess what's going to happen? It's going to happen that way. So be looking forward to that in the coming weeks as we, in, in a few weeks, get into more into to, to Jacob's life. And so, like when God promised, this is what's going on, like, just like when God promised to Sarah and to Abraham that, that through your offspring I will bless the nations. What he's saying here, God is saying is, hey, you don't know these children yet. Before they're even born, I'm going to make you a promise. I'm going to tell you how it's going to go down. I'm going to orchestrate this. God is faithful. God is, is, is doing the same thing, telling Rebecca telling I, uh, Isaac about what's about to unfold. And so when the days, verse 24, for when her days to give birth were completed, behold, the twins uh, were in her womb and the, the first came out red. Came out red. And I want you to know this. It's not blood. That's not what they're talking about. All of his body, like a hairy cloak. So they called his name Esau, which means red. This is what's going on here. This guy, I don't even know, Esau must be a tough guy. He has to be a tough guy. Because if you come out of the womb looking like Elmo, like you got to be kind of tough. Like a hairy cloak, a red body. What, when have you seen this? I mean, I've seen babies come out and they got, a, you know, a little hair. But like a hairy cloak, he's talking about like you just killed an animal, put it on your back. Like, and later we're going to find out that he's so hairy that he, his skin and his hair on his arm is comparable to that of a, an animal. Like a deer, if you touch his arms when he's an adult, it feels like a deer or a lamb or something. He's a hairy dude. I mean, I get it. Cool, I, I, I'm all for, for, for hairy dudes. Uh, whatever that means. Afterwards, his brother came out holding Esau's heel. So he called his name Jacob. 
Isaac was six years old when, when she bore them. And so what, what uh, if Esau means red, uh, also Jacob means a heel grabber or, or heel or deceiver. So what's going on here is that this is setting the stage for what's to come. Esau is, gonna, is a hairy man, a man's man. We're going to get into that in a moment. He's, he's a red man. And so this is Esau. His name is reflecting who he, what he looks like. Now here we see this. Uh, Jacob is grabbing on the heel. Grabbing the heel of Esau as they're coming out of the womb. So they name his name Jacob, uh, which means heel, but also means deceiver. Jacob is going to live his life as in deception. Continually, we're going to get into his first deception here. But 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 Jacob is is while he will be the son of the promise, he will be the one whom God chooses to bring about the blessing that will continue into the next generation. This man is not. I don't want you to see he's born a godly man. Oftentimes we we pit Jacob and Esau against one another. And we're like, you know, Jacob was the good son, Esau was the bad son. That's why why Jacob got the promise. No, Jacob is a deceiver. That's what the name means. And so when the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. This is literally in this language. They're talking like, hey, this dude's domesticated. This dude's a wild man. This guy likes AC. This guy goes and hunts bears. That's what's going on here. There's the man's man and the mama's man, mama's boy. That's, the, that's what they're describing. He liked dwelling in tents. This is not saying that he liked to camp. This is saying he didn't want to go do, he didn't want to get his hands rough. He didn't want to go out in the wild. He didn't want to work hard. He wanted to stay inside with his mom. And so uh, Isaac loved Esau. So, so because of this, I want you to see this. Because of this, you start having divisions in the family. Parents begin to pick favorites. And so what does Isaac do? He loves Esau more than he loves Jacob. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game. So Esau's out hunting. He's a skillful hunter. He's got the bow. He's out killing. He kills the elk, brings it home to dad, and they're feasting. He loves the way he cooks. He loves his meal. He loves the game, wild game that his son Esau cooks for him, kills for him. He's like, man, I love that boy. That's the kind of boy that we, that's going to lead generations. That's the kind of boy that's going to lead nations. That's the kind of boy that's going to, my firstborn, the one who's going to carry my legacy, my lineage future, Esau. I love him. But Rebecca loved Jacob. The parents here do an epic fail here. And they pick favorites. If you have, two, if you have multiple children, you don't have favorites. You ought not to. They do. And so next what we see is Esau's going to despise his birthright as the firstborn. He's going to sell his birthright. So here we go in, verse, in chapter 25, verse 29. Once when Jacob was eating, cooking, was cooking stew. So Jacob's a good cook, man. He's cooking stew. Uh, Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. Ever been there? Come in and from work, come in from a hard time, you come in exhausted, you're hungry, you need something. This is actually Americans, this is why we invented fast food, because this was us. Like, we are Esau. If you're ever wondering, you're like, Esau's the bad guy here. No, this is you. Ever been hungry and you just jump in the drive through line real quick? This whole uh, order things ahead of time means that you can actually get, like, places that sit down restaurants just like you would uh, fast food. If you plan ahead of time, you can, eat, they'll, you can either get, have them deliver it to you, this is the world we live in. This is the world we live in. Uh, he was so hungry, he comes in, he's, I'm exhausted. But I want you to think of this more like a teenage angst here. He comes in, he's like, oh, I'm so hungry. He's so hungry, he feels like he's going to die. And he's complaining here. He says, Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew, for I am exhausted. So Jacob has uh, made some red stew. I don't know if that was Esau's favorite color also, but he notices it. And he's like, yes, red stew. Therefore, his name shall be called Edom. Because of red. And Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. Like, this is a weird conversation. They show up, and the dude's like, I'm hungry. He's like, sell me your birthright. Almost doesn't make, makes me think, like, what? Like, 
is this, this guy's got to be joking. Like, does Esau come in and like, ha-ha, that's funny, buddy. <laughs> just give me some stew. Or like, hey, I'm the oldest. Like, move over. Let me just grab. Like, that's what I would have done. I'm the oldest. I would have just said, no, I'm just going to take it. Like, that's what brothers do. There would have been a fight, and it would have, no one would have eaten. Mom and dad would have come in. They would have been all in trouble. Like, that's what normal kids do. But no, this is what Jacob is. He's like sitting here stirring the stew, like, red stew. Oh, man, I hope, he come, I hope he doesn't kill anything. I hope my brother, when he's out there, out there, he's hunting. I hope he comes back exhausted, hungry. And I hope that he hasn't eaten, because then... I'm going to off the stew, and then guess what? I'm going to ask for his birthright. That's what he does. Some of your birthright. And Esau says this, I'm about to die. What good is a birthright to me? This is a teenager. I'm so hungry I'm going to die. This is like a three-year-old. I'm so hungry I'm going to die. That's He's exaggerating. He's not. He's not. He's like, sure, man. And verse 33, Jacob said, swear to me now. And so, like, he's going, hey, sell me your birthright. He goes, I'm about to die. What good is it? All right, so let's make an oath. Swear to me, because I need to get this in writing. You're about to give up your, your birthright for, a, for some stew. Crazy idea. Can't believe it's working. Let's do this. And so Jacob gave Esau, um, or it's in, in, so he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread. I'll throw in some bread now. You know what? Thanks to the birthright, that was too easy. Here's some lentil stew and some bread. And he ate and drank and rose and went on his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. So let me, let's, let's talk about what's going on here. What's going on with Esau is he's clearly impulsive. How many of you are just an impulsive person? You're an emotional person. You just act. You speak first, you think later. That's Esau. That's Esau. He's a bit dramatic here. Ever been there? Been a little bit dramatic? You're like, I'm so hungry, I'm going to die. You weren't really that hungry. That's Esau. He also seems to despise domestic duties. He's not going, hey, move over, I'm hungry, like, let me, can I have some of that stew? Or, hey, if there's not enough, can I, like, make my own? He, he's coming in like a college kid who doesn't know how to cook, give me some food or I'm going to die. He also, that means that he's, he's not in the, uh, he's not acting like a mature adult here. And so, but, but I want to also, us to see here that Esau, he's falling prey to his own appetites. I want you to see, he's driven by his appetite. That's what we're going to see with Esau. He's driven by desire, driven by lust in his heart, driven by a longing. His appetite is never satisfied, emotional, impulsive, lacks self-control. But I want you to see, he's falling prey, his own desire. See, this is the reality. Many of you will say, Satan tempted me. No, your, your sin in your own heart wells up and it seizes an opportunity. Satan may put an opportunity. Sin, may be, there may be opportunity around you. But the reason why we gravitate towards sin, the reason why we sin and rebel against God is because it starts internally. It starts with our appetite. This is the same thing with Eve. When Satan showed up as a serpent in the garden and offered her fruit, she says what? She looked at it and said it says it was pleasing to the eye. She sees it. She's led by her appetite. Satan then says, it'll make you wise. She's like, I want that. It'll make you like God. I'm already like that, but is there more? Is God, is God withholding from me? Deceived. She's deceived. She's deceived, but she's led by what? Her appetite. Esau is being deceived here, but he's led by his appetite. The reason why he falls to the temptation to sell his birthright, that, that he falls prey to, to Jacob's trick, is because he's a man who's led, not according to, led by, not by God's wisdom, not by God's word, not by God's will, not by God's ways, but he's led by his own internal appetite. And so Esau's actually Jacob's prey. Jacob, not a man of the field, not a, not a man with, skilled with a bow, not a hunting man. But a, but a skillful man, a deceptive man, a man who does have a prey. And it's not an animal, it's his brother. It's people. He's going to use, abuse, manipulate, and deceive people. That's Jacob's skill. It's not a good skill, but it's what he uses here. And Esau falls prey to Jacob. Esau kills nothing. He's out in the field, exhausted, comes back in. Jacob, opportunistic man, deceptive man, goes, hey, I got, I got something up my sleeve. Let me see if I can get one leg up on this man. Let me see if I can get him to turn over. 
his birthright, get a leg up. Esau at this moment not thinking about the future. Jacob only thinking about the future. Esau nearsighted. Jacob is planning, but out of a heart of deception, not a heart of faith. Esau lives in the moment and is foolish. Jacob architects very skillful, deceptive plans. And this is going to be a pattern and precedent for, for Jacob's life. Some of you, that's your pattern. But I want you to see this, that I don't, I don't know this to be true, but just imagine this. We saw that prior to Jacob's birth, in, or sorry, prior, prior to Esau and Jacob's birth, that God told him that the younger will serve the older. God had already said, hey, the favor, the promise will come through the younger son. So what it seems like Jacob is trying to do is exactly what Abraham and Sarah did. When God promised them that through, their, through, through, through Abraham's line would become the, the, the chosen child and ultimately the savior of the world. And when Sarah could not have a baby, what did they do? They opted for Hagar. They opted for a substitute. They tried to deceive and manipulate God's plan in order to, as if God needed their help. It, I, Jacob is doing the same thing here. God has already foretold. God has already promised that, that Jacob will be the one, the promised son whom whom the savior of the world would come through. God was gonna work through the younger, not the older. God said this before his birth. And here, Jacob probably knew that because he was in a great relationship with his mom, Rebekah. And so, here in this moment, Jacob is seizing an opportunity to get a leg up on something that God had already promised how many of you are trying to fulfill God's plan for your life, God's promise for your life, but in your own deceptive ways? Both of these brothers are not men of faith at this moment. But neither of these brothers are godly men at this moment. Both of them are walking in rebellion against God. One openly, one deceptively. Sometimes we only think that sin is external. Sin is internal. What comes out externally started first internally. So what is this birthright? This birthright is, not, is the inheritance of blessing of being the firstborn. This is, this, this is firstborn status. So what he's doing is saying, hey, Esau, can I, can, I know I'm the second child, but can I override you and become the first? Meaning that when dad gives over everything, just like Abraham gave everything to Isaac, can I be the recip recipient? Can I get your birthright? Can I get bump you up in birth order? He says, yeah, absolutely. That's what he's doing. He's, he, he wants firstborn status. It says here that Esau despised his birthright. That's why he traded it for this bowl of stew. So what's going on here in, in Hebrews 12 gives us some insight. We're going to look at it more later, but just Hebrews 12, 16, if you want to go back and read that. It says that Esau, it says a lot of things. But one of the things it says about Esau, it says that he was unholy. Or he was profane, or he was godless. So Hebrews is connecting this. What's inwardly in, in Esau's heart is a is a rebellion against God, an, a, a lack of trust in God, an unholy, profane, appetite chasing life. He's chasing his appetite over God's will for his life, and thus despises his birthright. Meaning this, he probably would have known. Esau probably would have known that through him. Through him would become the promised son. Through him, the next generation would be born. And through that person, the next generation, ultimately, the savior of the world, Jesus, would come. And he despised that reality. He says, I don't want to inherit the blessing that God gave to Abraham. I want to reject that blessing. I'll sell it for some stew because it's meaningless to me. That's what's going on here. It's not because he's hungry, it's because he despises his birthright. He despises God. He despises the idea that through him would come the savior of the world. He doesn't need God. He doesn't want God. He doesn't care about God. He's an independent man. He's a tough man. He kills his own food. He doesn't need God. But clearly Jacob does. I mean, mama's boy sitting at home. He can't provide for him. He can't handle himself. If he gets into a fight, he's going to lose. He's actually going to lose one later. He'll find that out. Wrestles. Loses the wrestling match. I don't need God, Jacob. Some of you, that's you. It's been you. Or that was you. 
want you to see for, for Esau, his highest good. I mean, if he thinks about the, his highest good, what is the highest good of his life? It's his own personal happiness. I'm hungry, give me food. I'm thirsty, give me something to drink. If I can just provide uh, uh, for myself and my family, then hey, I'm good. Esau is what, we, what he's chasing what is known as the American dream. Independence from people. Pursuit of happiness. The highest good is autonomy, not God's sovereignty. His highest authority in his life is not God, but himself. Is that your, what's, your, what's your highest good? Is it to make yourself happy or is it to make God happy? Is your highest good, to, to, is, your, is your highest authority yourself or is it God? Esau's highest good is his own personal happiness and his own personal authority. Therefore, he despises his birthright and gives it away, sells it for some stew. Because they, in his mind, it's worthless. It's worth just as much as he could get for a meal. And so making, making sense of this in the last few minutes of our time. Making sense of all this. So we have Abraham. He closes out his legacy. He has his promised son, Isaac. He, Isaac has two children, Jacob and Esau. Esau is a, despises his birthright. Jacob is a manipulator, a deceiver. This family is messed up. I want you to know your family is too. I want you to know that if you're a Christian, this is your family. This is your family. Sometimes it's just a book we read about. This is our legacy too. See, what God is doing is writing a story through broken people. Broken, messed up people like Jacob and Esau, like Abraham and Sarah, like Isaac and Ishmael. All of these men, God is writing a story through. His story through. He only uses broken and messed up people. It's the only people he uses. And so what I want us to see, he takes broken and messed up people and he invites them into his family. The perfect family. The holy family. A family that, is, uh, that, that, that actually is separated from sin. A, a family that is perfect and righteous. See, the story that's being told here and the mystery here is that God has a family. But the way into the family takes a miracle. It takes a miracle. Isaac, to be born, God had to perform a miracle for Sarah's womb to be open. For Rebecca to have Jacob and Esau, a miracle had to be performed because she was barren as well. For Jesus to be born in, without, without a sinful man, the Holy Spirit had to perform a miracle. Birth of Jesus came through the Virgin Mary, a miracle. In order for you to be born again, it takes a miracle. It's natural to be born into this earth. It's natural to be born into sin. It's natural to be born in to rebellion. It's supernatural to be reborn. What we're seeing here is that when God is saying, I'm choosing, I'm going to use Jacob, what, he's do, what we're seeing is God's going to take a messed up person just like he took Abraham. But God has got to intervene. God's got to show up. God's got to save. The, the, God's family is a divine call. It's not according to the flesh. It's according to the spirit. It's not according to natural birth. It's according to new birth. God often chooses, throughout the scriptures we see this, that God often chooses unlikely scenarios to bring about his promise. It's exactly what we see with Abraham. Picks a, he picks a pagan man, converts him. A guy who sells his wife a few times out, and he gives his wife away for free, a couple men, a foolish man. A guy who, who his wife mocks Jesus one time while they're having supper. Guy this, who, who's continually riddled by sin and takes this man, makes him his man, blesses him. Through him will become the son of the promise. And Isaac, also an imperfect man. If you and I were to write the story, the heroes in here, Abraham and Isaac, would be like these outstanding, morally upright, noble characters. See, God's ways are different than our ways. Jesus in the New Testament actually tells, of t there's a, a story he tells of two sons, just like these two sons. He says, Jesus is telling the, this story, and he says that there's two sons and one father. One son is a rebellious son, and he's going he's gonna to need his inheritance quickly so he can go buy prostitutes and he can go wayward in sin and go destroy and shipwreck his life. That's the first son, the rebellious son. 
And then there's the second son, another son who's this, the older son. The son that's going to be a, an upright man, a, be a religious man, not a rebellious man, but a, but a religious man who's going to stay at home and be near his father. The rebellious son goes and squanders all the money that his dad gave him. He wishes his father dead. He, he, he's a Jewish man that ends up eating the food of pigs. In defi- he's now a defiled man. He's a rebellious man. This is what we, we tend to see these, the rebels more than we see the religious because the sin of the rebellious is, is clear. They're running away from the father. It's clear. He's in rebellion. But then what we often miss is the sin of the second son, the righteous son, the religious son, or the, or the self-righteous son, the religious son. That other son, when the, when, when, when the rebellious son comes home, the father throws a feast, kills the fattened calf, throws a party. The older son the religious son despises his younger son, his younger brother. Why? He despises his dad's favor. He despises his dad's blessing. He despises his dad's ways. Esau despises God's ways. Esau's sin is in his heart and manifests in giving up his birthright. The older son, in the story that Jesus tells, The father invites him to join the party with the younger son, the rebellious son who's come home, who's repented, who's come back into the family, who's now been cleansed and made right. That son gets a party, and the father invites the older son, the religious son, into that party. But he, like Esau, despises his father, despises his right to be in the party, and withholds. See, oftentimes it's the religious people, the self-righteous people, the people who think that they've done nothing wrong, the people who think that they've been religious enough, they've gone to enough church events, they know enough Bible, they've been able to, uh, they've shared the gospel with enough people, they've made multiple disciples, they've done everything right, they deserve something, they're righteous. They may claim that they worship God, but truthfully, their own happiness is their highest good. They may claim that God is their own authority, but truly, they are their own authority. How do you know this? It's when their own authority is attacked and pressed on. They won't relinquish it. See, we live in a world that's falling apart, where where, uh, Christians are are leaving, quote-unquote Christians are leaving the faith. They don't want to be a part of Christianity anymore. And we're in a cultural conundrum where we're trying to figure out what's going on. Here's what's going on. Here's what's going on. When your highest good and your highest authority is you, you will walk away from Jesus. It doesn't matter what the cultural current will be. It doesn't matter what the political landscape will be. If you worship yourself over Jesus, eventually you will leave him. It doesn't matter. It could be in times of peace, times of war. If you worship yourself, you will eventually leave Jesus. Esau worships himself, self-righteous, American-made man. Rejects the promise. Rejects his birth. Despises God's plan. See, God uh, uses often unlikely situations. See, in the parable that Jesus is telling, saying the rebellious son who comes back home, we, we tend to, the, the crowd of that day would have thought, man, that, that, that child, that son coming back home should have been scolded, should have been beaten, should have been punished. And that all the opportunity, all the wealth, all the prosperity should have gone to the older son, the one who did not leave. But see what happened when that son came home, he had a heart change. And the son who remained home never had a heart change. And this is the essence of Christianity, that we all need heart changes. And some of you will, and the people in Jesus' time will look at the rebellious and say, that sounds foolish to let the, the rebellious kid in. In our day, what we will do is say, we will go, no, no, that doesn't sound foolish. It sounds foolish to reject the obedient one. And some of you, you're only obedient to earn God's love, and I need you to repent of that today. You can't earn God's love. You can't earn God's affection You can't earn God's blessing. You can't earn God's favor. We must receive it. In 1 Corinthians, Paul says, 
that God uses the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. Our world and its upheaval with Christianity, with culture, with the new term exvangelical, all these things that are going on, these wild things that are going on. I want you to see, when we look at the cross of Christ, it's either good news or it's foolish news. The Apostle Paul says that the, cro- the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. God uses the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. He uses the weak to shame the strong. What we're seeing here is God chooses Jacob, the weak, to shame the strong Esau. Jesus himself, the strongest man who ever lived, the most perfect man who ever lived. God in the flesh. That's why he was the strongest. What does he do? He humbles himself. The strongest man becomes weak. The sinless man, what? Bears our sin. Jesus Christ is what is, is, what, what, what is told through, through uh, Isaiah. He was despised and rejected on our behalf. See, Jesus takes the birthright, his birthright, his right as the firstborn, the promised son, and becomes, becomes despised and rejected and brutally beat and crucified and killed. Why? On our behalf. He did not despise his birthright, but he leaned into it. Jesus, the chosen one, the true chosen child, the, the, the promised son, becomes a spectacle to the watching world. Looks like foolishness to the watching world because the Savior, the most powerful man in the world, is killed. They killed God. Truly, God can't be real if we killed him. Despised, rejected. But Jesus, after being dead for three days, raises victorious, conquering sin, conquering Satan, conquering death, conquering the grave, providing a way for you to move from rebellion to family to self-righteous, to truly righteous, to religious, to relationship with God. God is calling you, every single one of you, to himself. The question you have to ask is, how will you respond? Some of you are like, well, I've already trusted Jesus. He's still calling you to himself. The father wants to be around his kids. The father wants to know his kids. The father wants to show his love to his kids. The father wants to bless his kids. But you're like, I've messed up. I've sinned so much. I come from a messed up family. I want you to see where sin separates, Jesus reconciles. And that's the story of Abraham. That's the story, we're going to hear the story of Jacob. That God's going to take this foolish man, this deceiver man, this wicked man, And he's going to tell his story, God's story. He's going to redeem him. He's going to reconcile him. He's going to transform him. And so if you've not put your faith in Jesus, I invite you to do that. Put your hope, put your life, put your trust in Jesus. If you do, if you do know, you do love, you do trust Jesus, continue to follow him, continue to worship him. What we're going to do in our response is we're going to take communion, remembering the, the broken body of Jesus, the shed blood of Jesus. When we take that and we eat of that, we rejoice in that Jesus gave up his birthright so that you could have the right of new birth into his family. We eat and drink and celebrate what, only, what God did was a miracle, not just in raising from the dead, but in saving you. So how do you need to respond? God is calling you, what will you do? Will you respond in faith like Abraham? Or will you despise God's word and walk away from him like Esau? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I ask for your blessing upon our time and response now. May the words that, 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 that I've spoken uh, penetrate to the hearts and the minds of the hearers. God, if there's anything that was said where you are working on people's heart that you would not relent until they've conceded. Lord, you're a good God. You're a gracious God. You love us so much. Now, as we respond, bless us mightily for your name's sake. May we rejoice and be glad for you are a good God. You're a good king. And Jesus, you are a great savior. We love you. Amen.